Please welcome to the stage the Death Wish Coffee Company. This is the welcome group. So uh, there are a lot of you up here, and I know you guys all have very unique and complicated roles inside the company, so it would probably be best, why don't you guys just go down the line, introduce yourself, and let people know what you do. My name is Mike Brown. I'm the owner, founder, CEO, and chief janitor at Deathwish Coffee. <laughs> uh, my name is Dustin Alexander. I do uh, shipping, I do inventory, and I do purchasing. I I'm also part of the podcast with Jeff. I'm Taya Torelli. I'm the marketing manager at, at Deathwish. I'm Kane Grogan, and I run our customer service department, some of our event stuff, and uh, sales, wholesale stuff like that. I'm Jeff Ayers. I run our brand new broadcasting division, and I uh, write and edit and produce our weekly podcast, Fueled by Deathcast. Uh, my name is Alyssa Hardy, and I'm the content manager for Deathwish. So the reason why we brought Deathwish here today, and I think it's relevant to a lot of Googlers, is um, there's this great sort of just like homecoming king-esque type story of starting out in a basement and just the explosion of the past five years that your company has gone through. Why don't you recap uh, the history of the company for us, Mike? Yeah. So back in 2008, I opened Saratoga Coffee Traders. And it was a small coffee shop in Saratoga Springs, New York. And I learned pretty quickly that I didn't know how to run a, a, a very good business because I lost all my money. I lost it all. <laughs> it all went all out the door. But I was very, um, uh, I didn't want to be a failure. So I kept trying and trying and trying and, and doing everything I could. I actually ha hired my, my best friend, Scott, to come work with me for basically free. And we just struggled. And every single day, we were in that shop trying to figure out how to make it in a brick and mortar business. And then one day, we're like, why don't we try to sell our coffee online? And that's when we developed uh, Death Wish Coffee. And it was, it was a, a recommendation from our customers, because they would always come in and be like, hey, can I have, you know, give me your strongest coffee. And we'd go and be like, all right, do they want the darkest coffee, or do they, do they want the most caffeinated coffee? And we're like, well, wait a minute. Let's just let's sit, sit down for a minute and figure this out. Let's make a coffee that's not only dark, <laughs> not only tastes strong, but also has the most caffeine. And and that's what we did. You know, we 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 developed this coffee by just blend. Well, we did a lot of experimentation. Well, let's let's back up because I, I do think it's important to qualify. Uh, Deathwish Coffee is known online as the world's strongest coffee. Yes. How do you qualify and quantify what that means to be the world's strongest coffee? Yeah, I, you know, I was never focused on caffeine at the outset. It was always about taste and flavor. Um, caffeine Informer and a few other publications online uh, uh, deemed us the world's strongest coffee um, with caffeine levels. But I don't know. We, we, personally, I don't like to focus on that just because you can brew coffee stronger by just adding more coffee and using less water. Um, so to me, it was all about flavor and good flavor, and, and you know, the, and, and and everything that, you know, when I when I drink a cup of coffee in the morning, I want to wake up. Right. You know, I want I want I want it to hit my like taste buds and have my eyes to shoot open. That's what I focused on that that experience. Um, but going back to your question, uh, like I said, I don't like to focus on the caffeine, but the caffeine does have something to do with it, and, and we because we use robusta beans. Uh, robusta beans have between two and three times the, the, the typical caffeine content of Arabica beans. Um, we do naturally get more caffeine in our coffee. And that's a big part of it, right? Because it, one would think that it would be easy to make a, you know, a new world's strongest coffee. You just go make a coffee and then find a bunch of caffeine and add, add some caffeine, yeah. So, people, but, but that's not really what's going on. You guys are, are have brewed this batch of beans and, and roasted it in such a way uh, to just naturally get this effect without having right, to force yep. it. Yep, it's organic. It's fair trade. There's no additives. We don't add any caffeine to it. It's just, you know, pure coffee. Mm. And that's you know, we're purists, believe it or not, and we love <laughs> we love just straight black drip coffee. Sure. <clears throat> so, so you find this niche. And you say, OK, I can start. People are demanding a certain thing from me, uh, the strongest coffee, high caffeine, but also really bold flavor. Uh, we got that. We want to get it out to the people. So you left brick and mortar behind and just said, we can do this via the web. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I still own my coffee shop right now. It's doing better, thank god. <laughs> but yes, we, 
we, you know, we, we took a stab at the online market, because my customer was like, hey, why don't you try selling this online? And I was like, all right, I'll try it. You know, I sold the bag via Google Ads. That's how I sold my first bag. And they said, and I got my first good review. And the, and the guy was like, I still remember his name, Phil Brunn. Um, <laughs> out, out of Oakland. <laughs> I felt adorable. Oakland. Yeah, I felt out of Oakland. Bought the first bag, and he gave me a good review. He's like, this is some strong coffee, and it's the, the, you know, some of the best coffee I ever had. And from there, like that review lead it up to another sale, and another sale. So I was selling basically one pound a week, and then two pounds a week, and then three pounds a week. And all of a sudden, it just snowballed into this company where it was me at first, me and uh, one of my ex-baristas, Megan. And then one day, Good Morning America gave me a call. And they're like, hey, we heard about your coffee online. We want to open the show with it tomorrow. Can we come up and interview, interview you? And I was like, <laughs> At that moment, I'd ponder that. For yeah, a you, you, you'd think I would, I would say yes immediately, but I, I don't know. There's that. It was a, I don't know. For me, it was a brave step because I, I knew I wanted it, but I didn't know if I was ready. But I was just like, yes. And they came that day. I'm like, when are you going to come? I was thinking like a week or two. <laughs> They're like, we'll be there in three hours. So they, Good Morning America, showed up at my store in three hours. I closed the store. I cleaned it up, and they interviewed me. And the next morning, they opened Good Morning America, drinking Death Wish coffee in our mugs. And Sam Champion was a weatherman at the time. And he, he was our coffee expert. And he said, this is some great coffee. And then from there, orders took off. Like, they were, I didn't have enough coffee, enough bags, enough people. Um, and that's how I basically hired everyone. It's just because it was just me at the time. And I was like, oh my god, I have all these orders that I have to fulfill. Where am I going to find people to help me do this? Mm -hmm. So I went to my, uh, my customers in my coffee shop, and I literally asked my customers, can you help me fulfill these orders? <laughs> and, and, that's, <laughs> and that's where like, everyone, that's where it started. And that's where I found like, the greatest people. Right. And, and which brings us to a lot of you guys. And the, the interesting thing I find about that is, is like you said, you, you pick people that you knew or people who were customers of yours. It, you guys are not necessarily barista coffee hey, it was. related, yeah. Yeah, I knew nothing about marketing though. I mean, I knew a little bit about coffee, but. So was how was the. We're, we're skipping a few major, major points. <laughs> so, <laughs> so fill it in, what are the major so points? So one of the things that uh, Mike uh, has omitted in that, that you know, Rax, the richest story, is that uh, he was looking for a way to supplement some income because the, um, the coffee shop was failing and, you know, he found a, a product that worked out, and they, him and Megan would just reach out to massive amounts of, just send emails, like cold emails, like, hey, we have the world's strongest coffee. That's how Good Morning America found it. It was literally in a basement, and they were just sending emails, and like, we have this thing. And it got mentioned in a few other publications first, and then when Good Morning America came, um, it was way worse than, than what Mike just said. It, when all those orders came in and, they, and I came on at that point, um, Tay came on a little bit after that. Our, our uh, good friend Eric Donovan was there, who you, you know personally. Um, and there was thousands and thousands of orders. And I remember just seeing it. We're in this basement where the floor is not really finished. And it's like shorter than I am tall. And it was just piles and literal piles of orders. And we were like stickering bags, filling coffee, like weighing it out one bag at a time. And it was insane. Um, we got kicked off of Amazon. We got a lifetime ban off of eBay because people thought we were scams. Um, so that, that was interesting. So it took what, was us the, a, what was the scammy? Because they, they, they didn't get their bag like, on our website at the time, which if you could go back, there is, I'm sure you guys know, there you, there's an archive.org or whatever it is where you can see websites. Yeah, yeah Google Wayback Machine. <laughs> the way then... Google Wayback Machine. Oh, it's, it's, I wouldn't have bought it, so that's on them because oh, they yeah. bought it off that Comic website. Comic Sans, embossed oh, everything. Yeah. World's <laughs> Comics Club, Las Vegas, flash, 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 flash. I, I was the web developer of that website. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it converted like crazy, first of all. The conversion rate on there is better than it is now. We had that. <laughs> You'll get it in five days, and it's like three, four weeks. And, and uh, we thought it was a dead company. I didn't get hired for three. I kept coming back every day for three 
three months. I didn't get, actually get hired because we didn't think it was going to be a company after that. Like, well, we just watched a ship sink, and uh, let's play the Titanic song as we go down. And uh, it wasn't that. You know, we, we, we uh, through customer service uh, and just apologizing to everybody and saying, you're going to get it, um, people kept ordering. And then we spent the next year and a half trying to build a foundation um, to the company. Uh, we moved into a warehouse. We begged and begged and begged Amazon and eBay to let us back on. <laughs> um, and now we're the best-selling coffee on Amazon. So that's and I think the in, on Google, too, and, and, and the internet, for a lot of times, we're the number one coffee and sometimes the number one grocery product on Amazon. So that was just an, an attest, an, a testament to Mike and him just being like, we're going to do this the right way. We're not going to screw people over. We're not going to you know, fold. We're just going to give everybody what we promised. And, uh, and we were able to deliver. And it was a, a pretty amazing time for the company. Mm -hmm. One of the common threads of the story uh, seems to be this, this foundation based around communication. You guys are very, very communicative to, you know, like you said, people are placing an order expecting it in five days. You're then reaching out to them three weeks later and communicating the delays. Um, but this is not uncommon. Like you guys embraced the online space. You guys embraced so much social media. Talk about why going that route. Like it, you could easily have taken out a loan and spent a hundred thousand dollars on a marketing campaign. Yeah. Uh, but going this route seems to have been very effective for you. Yeah. Our number one value is customer satisfaction, and we. we I give everyone absolute freedom to go above and beyond to make sure our customers are satisfied and happy. And I, I know people say that a lot, especially businesses, but our number two value is profitability. And it's all, it's, it's a ranking system. So we will, because customer satisfaction is our number one value, and then to be profitable is, uh, you know, it's two or three or four, I can't remember exactly, but we, we will take losses to make our customers happy. So we'll, we'll go above and beyond to to do that. I, I, you know, one story I'm thinking of that just pops into my head uh, is one one day a, a customer called and he was very upset with our K-Cups. We had these new K-Cups and Keurig came out with a, a new brewer, the, the Keurig 2.0. And the guy's like, you know, I bought your cups. They don't work in my new machine. And he's like, he was very upset. And I'm like, right. you don't mess with people's coffee. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, well, I'm like, how am I going to fix this problem? So I talked to the customer service, and they were like, oh, we can send them another bag. And I'm like, no, you know, let's just send them a new, like a better brewer. So we went and we found that the top rated uh, single serve brewer, and we sent this guy like a brand new brewer, and it wasn't the, it wasn't a Keurig brand. It was, it was, I think it was the Ox Box, and you know, it was just the top rated brewer at the time. And we sent that to him, and I've never, and, and that guy, he turned out to be a CEO of like some like big construction company, and he was floored. He's like, you guys are amazing. And, and to me, like, that, that doesn't say, I don't know, that means a lot about my customer service team, that they, they would think of it, think to do that, and that's what we're all about, just making people's day, like being able to provide that type of value to our customers, where it's not just, um, you know, yeah, here's another bag of cups, you know, good luck. Mm -hmm. like, no, we want to really embrace customer service. Well, and it seems to go more than just embracing good customer service because you've expanded out into social media in unique ways uh, that, again, foster communication and sort of community, uh, which is interesting for a consumable product company, I think. And, and that sort of leads us, uh, leads us into the conversation about the podcast. So as part of all this social media growth, you guys have created your own identity and branded a podcast? Yeah. I mean, Dustin can talk a little bit more about that, I bet. But I mean, to me, like, it just seemed like we want to fuel people's passion. That's our, that's our motto. And to do that, I feel like we have to be in contact with them on a regular basis. And, and, and sometimes people are only buying coffee, you know, once a month. So we, you know, we're thinking, how, how can we be a part of these people's lives uh, on an ongoing basis? And that's where the podcast came in. Yeah, when um, when Michael first brought it up, it was to me it was a way to give a voice for the company, um, not only with our employees, so we do employee uh, interviews, but also with all the influencers that we work with, because we work with a lot of influencers that now have a voice through the company with the podcast. But on top of that, you know, it gives a little bit more for the customer to be a part of the company and also keep really well informed with the company. There's a, a clear style um, to the identity of the, the company. I mean, obviously, 
it's a bold step to call yourself death wish coffee. Why would you want to actively drink something that <laughs> is threatening your life? But that sort of... Do you want to hear the story behind that? I, I do, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so the whole thought of the, 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 but the name and, and the image of the coffee is, I was, you know, when I was coming up with Death Wish Coffee, I was sitting, it was at night. So imagine me sitting in a, a room at night, it's dark out. All I have is this computer screen in front of me. And I was in my second floor apartment and poor, as broke as a joke. Like I had, <laughs> I was so poor. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, how, what? What am I, what, I had this product in mind and like how do I put this on a screen? And I looked down at this can, I was, I was drinking a Four loco at the time, <laughs> right? That worked say it yeah. worked up. I was drinking a Four loco at the time and on the, the koozie I had on it had a picture of this uh, mean dog and my girlfriend had bought me uh, this koozie when she went away on vacation and it said Death Wish under it. And I'm like, oh, I mean, that's, that's a cool, that's a pretty cool like, name. I could, I, could, I could go with that for a name of this coffee. And I'm like, how am I gonna, what would I wanna see if I walked into somebody's kitchen? Like if I saw a bag of coffee, what would I pick up and look at and be intrigued by? And I had this image of a poison, like a poison bottle, like an old school like right. poison vial. Like you'd pick up and be like, what is, like what kind of coffee are you drinking with this poison label on it? Um, and that was the whole concept behind it. And I was like, death wish, poison bottle, this could, this could work. So, you know, I did some, like, I went into Photoshop and, like, Photoshopped some stuff around. And so, like, I got the preliminary logo. It's not the logo it is now. Um, I pointed at my wrist because I actually have the logo on my wrist, which is it's just not a, a temporary tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> there are tattoos. <laughs> but, um, you have tattoos of it. Yeah, it was that poison logo, that, that's the whole image I had in my, in my brain at the time. And it... Well, and it's fed so much into the larger identity at this point. You guys, uh, with the podcast, have really embraced this, and I know you're big into MMA. Yep. Um, and you guys have some influencers from that space. That and cool. rock and roll, and yeah, I mean, that whole area of edgy influencers has, has yeah. just opened up to us. It becomes like a lifestyle brand at yeah. a certain point. Pretty right? early Absolutely. On. Pretty early on, it became a lifestyle brand. Um, we realized, and I don't think it was the intent. If you look at some of our uh, original ads, it was you know a lawyer who can't wake up in the morning, so he like drinks the coffee. But we found out that our number one people that were spreading the word were either like you know musicians or, or recovered addicts who wanted something to to, to kind of sink their teeth into in a brand that really spoke to them and and so many people drink coffee it's the number two commodity in the world behind oil um, and we had the edgiest most badass brand and when we started this thing there was or when Mike started there was no world's strongest coffee now you can google <laughs> it's weird that I'm here <laughs> you can say that you, now, can you. <laughs> yeah, now you can search on the internet um, <laughs> no it's kind of cool but you can and you, you see so many different people claiming to have that claim and they have our you know uh, one of my favorite stories is we see so many websites that try to like knock us off and there was one that used our exact HTML, uh, HTML code and didn't take the bottom off. So it said, why try Death Wish? Click here. <laughs> <laughs> In our bag. And, our and it was, it. It was our, also effectively signing people up for your email. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Right. Cool. Right. totally. Exactly. Um, yeah, our, the our, opt-in actually, we collected email addresses from yeah. some imposters website. They failed. <laughs> um, they had their our bag with their logo photoshopped on top of it. And we would email them and be like, that's our bag. And they're like, no, it's not. It's like, it has our address on it on the side of the bag that you still put on your, your website. <laughs> Half photoshopped it. Yeah, it was it was ridiculous. But, but um, yeah, speaking to it being a, a lifestyle brand, I mean, there are people who rock our shirts and our and our hats and everything like that without actually even trying the coffee. So and get tattoos and and get tattoos. Um, people who have they probably tried the coffee at that point though. That's true. Um, <laughs> I'd hope so. Yeah, let's do it. You've, you've mentioned tattoos several. Sorry to to cut that off. Were you? Oh, I mean, yeah, so we have a few of our biggest fans definitely have um, our logo tattooed on them, which is in insane. People call five? us all the time. Five it's way it's more than way five. Than five now. They call I'd us and they say, hey, we want to get your logo tattooed. Is that okay? Well, that's a big commitment. You know, we're never like, oh, just go ahead and do it. It's kind of like, are you sure you want to do this? You know, we do try and kind of talk them down, but it, it is pretty cool. Either well, we're honored. <laughs> were there, you guys just finished the, the New York City tattoo. tattoo yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did anybody, did you watch anybody get a Death Witch tattoo? No. No, no actually. We weren't going. I mean, just, it's, it's tough. It's a weird commitment. Just you. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's strange. Yeah, um, temporary. Yeah, I always, we always joke after they get it, like, oh, that sucks. We're actually selling our name. We're going to be something else. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's insane. It very early became a lifestyle brand. And one of our first marketing campaigns um, was, you know, what fuels you. You are fueled by death. Um, and that kind of, to kind of skip forward back to the podcast, which, which started a few months ago. And Jeff is also the co-host of that. And he kind of headed that whole project. Um, we found out very early on that it wasn't just, you know, musicians and, and, and all these people. It was uh, engineers, it was, you know, comic nurses. book artists, nurses, you know, passionate Astronauts. people about what they do for a living and, and their art. Olympians. And Fueled, Fueled by death isn't just an idea of, you know, what is your coffee. And coffee, I, like we keep saying, is a lifestyle. But Fueled by death is every single one of us in this room, every single one of us outside of this room on this planet wants to do something significant before we leave this planet for good because death is inevitable whether you get hit by a bus in, in five minutes or you live to be 90 years old and what's interesting is is that everybody in the world enjoys figuring that out whether it's a it's a hard you know journey to get there or it's something that you know you're passionate about and it's very interesting to attack a, a conversation that way and that's where the, the idea of this podcast kind of came back up about and it's interesting to be able to bring it to a business. And because we're not sitting there and being like, well, what kind of coffee do you like and why does that fuel you? It's It'd like, get no, boring you, real quick. What? <laughs> that would get boring real it would quick. Give, it would get yeah. incredibly boring. But I mean, like, we've talked to, you know, astronauts and rock stars and, and normal people. And, like, why are you, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And what gets you out of bed the next morning? Why, why are you doing it? Not the coffee. There's there's something there's something that you're passionate about, and that conversation is always will never not be interesting, you know. And that's and that's kind of what we are all about as a lifestyle brand too, because what's fun about a coffee company is coffee is a lifestyle. I, all of you out there probably have your own way that you drink coffee, and it becomes your morning ritual. Whether it's just putting it in a drip machine and hitting the brew button, or going to a gas station, or going to a gas station, or yeah, brewing, right. you know, taking out your your chemistry set and really making that perfect cup of coffee. Like whatever it is, that is your pat that your passion for the, your coffee at that moment. But after you drink your coffee, then your day starts, you know. And then what are you doing with your day? And we want to be a part of your day, not just in that in that beginning of it, you know. It's it's a it's a great narrative to hear about the passion, the seeking passion in in the people who are around you and a part of that lifestyle, and then equating that back to what you went through to actually get this thing up off the ground. Uh, looking back at it now, uh, were there times when you thought, you know what, this isn't worth it, or were there times that you had to like refine that passion in yourself of like, I, we can make this work. I do want to do it, even though it's. Early on with the, with the coffee shop, I, I believe when I started Death Wish, I was probably only uh, probably one or two months from closing the doors because it was, it was, I just didn't have any money left. Like, I had my car repoed, I had to sell my house, I, was living with, I had to move back in with my mom, I was living in, behind the garage. So I was very close to you know, calling it quits and just, you know. But I, I am super, I try to be like, I, I didn't want to be a failure. You know what I mean? That, to me, like, that word, and it's funny. I think back, and people, my friends and family, they, hey, Mike, how's things going to the coffee shop? And every time, I'm like, oh, they're going great. Thanks for asking. <laughs> but deep inside, I was just like, I'm, I'm crashing and burning here, you know? Oh. So, <laughs> yeah. So after that, I was, you know, I'm like, oh, I got to try something. So yeah, the online. The, once the online sales started to pick up, I'm like, holy crap! Like maybe I can keep this thing open a little bit longer. And I'm like, if I just make like 5,000 bucks a year, <laughs> like that's pretty much all I need to like make, make things, if I worked a little longer. So yeah, there was that time where I was almost, I was at the absolute, you know, ready to, ready to call it quits. But yeah, we, I hung on and I, I kept going with it and I was just, I'm like, I'll pay my bills back someday, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and I did, so. <laughs> I do want to uh, speak about something specific, which is I would like for you guys to talk about the Super Bowl ad oh, and man. how that came to pass, because I think it's a testament to your activity on the social media space and, and how hard you guys work to build that community and then that actually, that community paying you back. Interesting. We have the greatest fans, community, customers in the world, hands down. 
Like they, like when we keep going back to lifestyle, we keep talking about that. They made it a lifestyle. You know, they made this brand what it is. And they're, they're the reason why we we got the Super Bowl commercial in the first place because it was uh, it was Intuit's uh, uh, small, small big, business, big game yeah, competition. Small business. So basically, yes. Intuit QuickBooks put out a um, contest for a small business uh, with less than I think 50 employees, um, and about 15,000 businesses actually entered that, and we were one of them. Um, and it was a vote-based contest, so basically you would ask your uh, community to vote for you, click a, click a very simple link, um, and essentially the contest was very simple. Uh, the person with the most votes would win. Um, so it ended up being narrowed down to, I think, a few hundred, and then uh, and then 10, and that was insane. I mean, out of 15,000, we had no idea, but coming back to the, the failure conversation that you were having, I think that was the first time where we kind of said, if if we don't win this, that would suck. Like it, it felt like it would be a setback, and it was almost our. We put so much work into we it. We put so yeah. much work into it, it. It felt like it would be the end of the world, and I think that is one of the reasons why we ended up winning. Because um, we put 100 percent of our focus on winning the competition. It, was, it sounds silly, but it really brought our our team together. Like that one driving purpose, and every day we'd start. We'd be like, "How are we going to get more votes today? How are we going to get more votes today?" Yep. And it came down to us and Chubbies and Viddlers. Sure, Viddlers is a five and dime out of Buffalo, New York. Great small little store. They had all of Buffalo, all six million people in Buffalo behind them voting every day. And they were a <laughs> brick and mortar shop that would sell, that sold fine, uh, tiny figurines and little Chinese candies. finger traps. They didn't yeah. want to win. <laughs> they were like, they were, we don't, oh, we're not. I'm like, well, what would we do if we win? And, and Intuit did tell us after, I don't know if I should say this, but they were like, if, if someone like that won, we wouldn't ever do this contest again because there's no way to quantify that or help that out, but um, it was it was insane. Uh, you know, the first three months it was a six month competition, and the first three months were it started with fifteen thousand, and, and I honestly didn't think you have a chance. We, we were seven employees at the time. We're going against some some juggernauts of companies. I mean, for instance, Chubby Shorts, while they have a little less than fifty employees, they have one hundred and twenty five college brand ambassadors spreading the word, which aren't on the books. Which I think that's cheating. That's, <laughs> that's just my opinion. No big deal. Um, but when very nice. said, those guys are good guys. <laughs> they were cool. They were cool. Um, but when when they said we won the top ten, it, it became very real. Um, and then it's like, okay, we did a lot of work up until this point, but we were kind of like still doing our day to day stuff. Once they're like, you guys are one of ten, and they basically picked, you know, you had to have a, a community of people voting, but they also picked really good stories. Like one, <laughs> some of the people we were going against in the top ten were like uh, this Harvard business person, uh, this this awesome awesome chick was trying to solve world hunger by uh, you put your fruit and whatever on this paper and it would it would uh, make it last longer and it's like we just sell coffee like <laughs> we're going against amazing amazing stories and amazing companies and all 10 of them were very incredible uh, stories so when we actually won it um, we you know it was it was the first time we came together as a team and it really team is the most important thing like, you can really do anything you want to do you just have to be have everyone bought in and I, I think we realized that we can accomplish pretty much anything if if we, I mean, it sounds so cliche, but if you put your mind to it, and every day Mike would be like, you know, what is what is seven million dollars worth to you? What would you do for seven million dollars? Because that's essentially what you're getting. You're getting a seven million dollar commercial. And we were going to be set as a business if we could just figure out how to win this thing, and uh, it was a lot of pressure. And there were months where we didn't have a day off. We were going to every event, like. Um, me and Michael go to a literal, you know, football game and just hand out things. Just like, yeah, we're a coffee company. Vote for us. Here's some in Buffalo, stuff. I and, might add. In Buffalo, <laughs> we didn't realize we were going against those guys. But <laughs> Taya knows. Taya would head our mark. She's the head of our marketing, so she had. Okay, let's try this today. Let's try this today. We're we're not there. We're not winning, and it was insane. I would say that if we didn't establish customer service as our number one value way before this uh, competition, I don't think we would have won because it wouldn't have resonated with our fans or with our community at all. Um, and they, we have made it a point um, to involve them with the company the entire time. So I think that kind of set us up. Uh, you know, our fans would would contact us and say, "Hey, I set a calendar invite on my on my calendar so that I remember to vote for every it, day, every single day." Um, I created a separate mailing list um, opt-in for people. You know, we would send one a day, and almost no one unsubscribed from that list, which is insane. And the open rates and the click rates were incredible. Um, so our community. Um, and just placing placing them on top of our values, I think, is the most important thing that we ever did. And I mean, we never knew it would have uh, actually come back to us in, in such a great way. 
mm-hmm. being real and genuine also. And, and one of the things that, you know, like Mike and Taya found out early on where they want, people wanted to see, you know, your faces. They, they have your, now their favorite coffee brand. Um, and they, we made, you know, our brand very relatable. Like none of us have experience in any of the things we have jobs in now. You know, um, most of us didn't graduate from college. We, we basically <laughs> Googled <laughs> how to run a business. <laughs> Thanks, do guys. Like, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but seriously, it was literally like we had a Google education. I know you guys probably heard that, and it might be one of those weird trigger things like, ugh, but we did. We were literally like, how do you run social media? How do you run an ad campaign? And how do you still do, do it today. And yeah, we, still, we still do that. And because of that, we were able to kind of like, we didn't have a whole 20 years of, of experience and like, this is the way it is, this is the way we're going to go. A lot of those dinosaurs fall with the times. We are the times. Like, we literally grew up in this age and this era, and we figured out how to do everything by just searching it online. And it's an attest, like, a testament to the power of what you guys do, which is incredible. And uh, that's kind of where we, why we are where we are today. Well, it, it is a story of a very meteoric rise, a uh, very short time period to go from the brick and mortar basement roasting, you know, coming up with the, the recipe to where you are now, where it's the line is diversified. Like you said, you're making everything from whole bean to like K cups that people can buy and just pop in a machine. Uh, I want to have you guys speak to somewhere out there, maybe here it's a Googler or maybe it's somebody who's watching uh, the video at home that has their thing, their passion, and they want, it, they want a similar kind of experience. What, what would you tell them? How would you advise them to, to get involved into that, to maybe not mimic what you guys have done, but right. at least be on that path? Yeah, I mean, just go for it. And when you feel like you're getting uncomfortable, then just push a little further. Because I feel like, you know, thinking back, that point in my life where I almost quit, I was that close to success. You know what I mean? I was that close. And I did just push a little bit further. So whatever you're doing, if you have a passion, go for it. And right when you get to that point where you're about to quit, just be like, actually, no, I'm going to push myself you know, two steps further. And I think that. If everyone did that, which is a little bit more persistent, like the, the the things you can accomplish are amazing. Do you guys agree? I mean, you guys, yeah. Uh, yeah. the podcast creators who are here, you guys just started doing it, right? Yeah, out of, I out of nowhere, and and you guys have now grown to a, a fairly decent presence. And we're still yeah. a baby cast, just thirty episodes out right now. But I mean, yeah, it's it's one thing I say about this company, and this really works towards any kind of. Anything, anything you're passionate about is that, you know, this company, Deathwish Coffee, is, I always equate it to a living, breathing organism. It's something that learns every day. It's not just coffee, it's not just the brand, it's, it's what we're trying to achieve, what we're trying to do. And anything, whether it's the video game you like or, or you know, the hobby that you're creating, you know, in your workshop at home or the job that you have to go to day in and day out. There's always another journey. There's always another path you can take to get to the goal. The goal is just there, but that's never the finish line. There's never a finish line. And we talk about that a lot on the podcast. In fact, one of the influencers of the company said it the best, and we quote him probably every single time, and Dustin knows who I'm going to say. Yeah, EJ, EJ Snyder. Snyder yeah. was on Naked and Afraid. Um, <laughs> he said it the best. He said, you either win or you learn. There is no losing. There's never losing. And, and, there's, and when you win, there's more to go. You know, And that's a, that's a testament to what we do, but it's a testament to what you all do, what anybody can do. And I think that's, I think that's powerful. And just to speak on what, what Michael brought up, Jeff and I were podcasting before we started podcasting for the company. We, we had our own little mini podcast, but we were kind of hitting the end of the road there where it was like, is this done? Are we done with this? And we decided we were going to hang on to it. And then that's when Mike was like, well, why don't you do it for the company? And it was like, yeah. Let's do it. Let's get it together. Now we have a vision. We, you know, we have a, a focus, and we now it's been great. It's been amazing. It's been an amazing trip, and it's been very short so far. And we're not even we're not even started. You know, I mean, we started out doing the idea, like, hey, let's have a weekly podcast where people can learn about the company, but we can also, you know, ask those questions to influencers and, and interesting people and the employees as well. But now we're adding video. And we're adding live video. We're doing Facebook Lives, and we're doing um, as we do it. And live, I'm learning how to do TV tricks 
as we're going live. So I'm on camera talking to you and also putting camera two on as it's happening with other graphics and I'm failing, but I'm doing better he's, at it. He's like, learning. He's, he's learning. learning. Yeah, yeah he's you know, failing. like, yeah. So I mean, like, um, <laughs> there's always new ideas. There's always new ways to, like, Im not even just, it's not improving something. It's just going farther, going going that extra step, you know, like, it's, it's awesome. And it's always going to be tough when you're breaking ground. I mean, we're doing things that no other co especially coffee companies are doing. No other coffee companies are making a podcast like we're doing it or, you know, making comic books like we do. Um, but when you break ground, nobody's been there before. You can't just Google it. You know, how do I start a podcast and make it a live show on Facebook Live? You're not going to get an answer. So it's, it's just a nature of the beast of breaking ground. You're going to have to figure out stuff that nobody's figured out yet. But that's where the success comes from. Going back to Mike's story, I think this is really important. Um, Mike mentioned pushing past your um, uncomfortable point. Um, making a list of your worst case scenario, I know that's what Mike definitely did, and um, weighing whether or not those things are worse than failing business-wise. Um, I know Mike made a list of his worst case scenario, and all of them ended up happening. Um, moving back <laughs> to his mom's place, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you do kind of have to push past that a little bit. So I do think, going back to your original question, make a list of the worst things that could possibly happen. And if you're OK with those things happening um, at the expense of creating an amazing business, yeah, just, just try it out. Won't definitely work, but at least you'll know. You'll know what's to come. I mean, mm -hmm. it's part of, Worst case scenario is not doing it at all. I That's know. true. Part of the uh, what we kind of omitted from this, this kind of rags the riches story is Mike had a career. He had his master's in accounting. He was an accountant for the state, worked for the state, had seen all these people that do this thing where they show up every day to work and they're just like, you know, no one's really happy. No one's, there's nothing really driving them. They're just like kind of, you know, ro robotic. They just get up and they drink their coffee. Uh, and then they go to work and they do their thing and they go home and they go to bed. And he's like, you know, I hate this. I want to do something, you know, that I, I, I like. And I like being in coffee shops. I don't know much about coffee, but I can figure it out. And then, you know, a lot of us were at crossroads in life when we kind of um, joined the team. And I would say that the most important thing is just never settling. Um, I know that, like, so he, he had a career. He didn't like it, tried something else. And it took, you know, it took five or six years before everyone told him it was like the worst thing, worst decision he was going to make. Um, um, I personally, you know, I dropped out of community college three times. I was a banker. I had the whole career in banking uh, when I was in my uh, early 20s. I hated it. Um, I quit. My uh, family and friends told me it was the worst decision. I moved back to upstate New York, and I ended up basically homeless uh, for a while. My Found couch. His couch, <laughs> Eric's couch. I was, spent a lot of time with Matt and, and his beautiful wife, and, and it was it was a very, very dark time. But I found Death Wish, and it's just seizing opportunity. And now Taya's got similar stories. Alyssa worked for a Teen Vogue, I think, for a little while. She still does, and we've all done things. You worked for a kitchen. You worked for a kitchen. Like, it, it was, you know, a lot of different times where we just weren't, you know, happy with our current situation. And a lot of people settle, and I think that's the biggest mistake you can make, is just dealing with it because you think that's all you got and just looking for opportunities and and uh, and when they're there you know doors will open you just have to know to walk through them very good very good I do want to leave plenty of time for you guys uh, to ask questions as well there are microphones in the aisles so I encourage you to, to make your way to the microphones uh, with your questions prepared while people are getting ready I want you guys to go down the line and I want you to tell me how you take your coffee oh. yes I take my coffee out of a Chemex typically black no sugar and no cream as strong as you can make it, but I only drink it in the morning. <laughs> I get a little weirder with it. I, uh, I make something called death proof coffee, which is mixed with butter, MCT oil, blended. Um, I stick a few other things in there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my morning ritual. <laughs> One cup in the morning, I'm good to go all day. Um, typically, I mean, I actually came in as like a coffee con connoisseur and I was such a brat. Um, I still love that still kind is. of third wave coffee, but um, Typically black, but you'll you'll catch me going to the Keurig a lot more than I'll admit. <laughs> so here I am. I have uh, my my two different uh, kinds where it's like I have my hangover on Sunday where just like 
really just terrible diner coffee with a bunch of cream and sugar. Um, I've also figured out through this job, I didn't know much about coffee, ways to use it as a literal uh, utility to get you through your day. Uh, a lot of people will drink an ener energy drink or something like that, and Tay would always be like, dude, there's more caffeine in coffee than there is in that. You don't need that. It's terrible for you. Um, so I usually have three cups uh, between 8 and 11, um, and it, <laughs> it'll get me to, to about 3 where I start that, that uh, crash, and then I'll have one more cup because it allows me to go home and get stuff done after work. So, I used to be cream and sugar all the time, and then I got really lazy in college. So it's black, and it's a lot. I drink probably drink five some, or six cups a, a day. My yeah. desk is directly next to all of our coffee machines, and I'm bouncing off the walls by five. And he so. never shuts up. He never shuts up, and he started having panic attacks, so he's had to calm down. <laughs> you ever seen that Dave Grohl video where it's like, fresh pods? <laughs> like, his me. wife was like, are you all right? Like, what it's happened? It's maybe not a like, shining endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm it's having... just an occupational hazard when you work with coffee. Yeah. It's, just, it's just how it works. Especially when you don't pay for it where we work, and we have really strong coffee. And then we started <laughs> this new dangerous. thing. And one of the things I do want to say real quick is we, we always look for alternative methods, and we just released a nitro cold brew, which is very concentrated death wish coffee. And Jeff would go at home and have a panic attack and not know why. And uh, it's because he would have one of those too late in the afternoon. So, yeah. <laughs> How about you? Um, I wake up very, very early, so I start with a Chemex, and I put a little bit of almond milk in it. And then I get to work, and I make one the second I get to work <laughs> in a French press. No. Please. I feel like we haven't heard a lot about the coffee itself yet, so I'm very curious about things like uh, sourcing, uh, roasting, how you blend it, where you, uh, and also, like I guess most importantly, like it's very unusual to have a good, like higher end coffee be made out of, of robusta, and what it's like, you know, using that rather than arabica, which every other single company I'm aware of uses. We use arabica as well. Okay. So um, part of the plan. I think our. I think Mike's Mike. Yeah, I mean, I, I, our roaster is not here today. Probably, that's probably why we haven't talked about it. Much, if but we told you, we'd have. <laughs> um, We're gonna kill it's you. It's an uh, it's an Indian Peruvian blend. Um, so we get the robusta beans from India. They're organic and fair trade. We're actually one of the few companies out there that that have uh, an, or, or an organic source for robusta. Most robusta you find. Um, it doesn't have the, uh, the USDA organic certification on it, but you know, we have a very good uh, supplier. We work with importers, and actually in New York here, and New Jersey, um, and on the West Coast, and, and they're able to source that for us. Um, the Peruvian is also organic fair trade. Our coffee is uh, blended post-roast, so we don't blend the beans and then roast them. We roast them separately, so you'll see, if you actually open a bag, you'll see two different shades in there. Because we found that if you if you blend it post roast, um, the flavor you'll get a more um, uh, fuller flavor. Uh, we use Loring roasters. It's almost like a giant um, popcorn popper. I like to say uh, there's no direct flame on the beans ever, so there's no scorching. If you crack our beans open, they're roasted uh, uniformly straight through. Um, it's the most efficient roaster on the market right now um, because it circulates the hot air so we don't waste uh, a, a lot of gas and there's not a lot of exhaust either it also um, make it also provides the benefit of us not having to have an afterburner which a lot of companies uh, will have which will reduce the environmental impact so it's the most environmental friendly roaster we have two of those we have a 35 kilo and a 70 kilo uh, at this time and I want to speak a little bit on um, specialty coffee um, and Robusta a little bit. Definitely when we first entered the coffee uh, industry, uh, Robusta was not highly regarded. I wouldn't say it's highly regarded. It's still, still not, yeah. But um, there are the SCAA, which is the Specialty Coffee Association of America, um, they actually have set up something at all of their events um, to compete with Robusta. And um, that's something that I'm actually really proud of at this point. It's cool you get to taste Robusta against each other. So even though it's not necessarily like the third wave kind of light roast um, uh, choice, uh, it definitely is its own beast that people do love and enjoy. And I think it's 60% uh, of coffee enjoyed is a lot of the times mixed with robusta. Right now, um, yeah, be, be, especially because there's been a, there's been a problem with coffee rust, um, mm -hmm. and because of this, uh, the coffee industry is starting to ha uh, make hybrid plants with arabica and robusta because the robusta is much more uh, hardy. It, it can Resilient. defend against this coffee rust that they were 
initially thinking it was going to you know, really raise coffee prices, but because they were able to uh, blend the, the, the two plants together, um, it's resistant. So actually, a lot of coffee you're probably getting now that you think Syrabica has some, has some Robusta in it. <laughs> there Sorry. actually was studies that were just done where uh, scientists just cracked the genome on Robusta coffee. And Arabica has been out there for about a year. And so both genomes are now completely mappable. And that's why we're getting a lot of these hybrid plants, which is very interesting, because now we're going to be able to get a new type of bean you know, that it has never even, the, the world's never seen. And the possibilities of coffee are endless again. So it's, it's pretty exciting. I think a lot of people just, you hear like, oh, single origin Arabica beans. Like you just hear that from different people and you think like, oh, yeah, that's the best one, right? Like that's what I thought. I was like, yeah, that's the best. I didn't, you don't know. You just don't yeah, know yeah. until you try it. So a lot of people just. The blind taste it. tests are very funny, especially, I mean, yeah. coming from me, I was, I would criticize everyone's way of brewing coffee. And I was, you know, I was that person kind of until someone stuck a blind taste test in front of me. And then who was a jerk? <laughs> yeah, but the good thing, um, it's all personal preference. It's, all personal preference. I tell people that all the time. We try to kind of, we're like the gateway coffee drug. Um, and I think having someone like Taya and, you know, that, that has really been around coffee for a long time, people will buy it because it is it has a gimmicky approach, right? It's, it's Cone Crossbones, world strongest coffee. People are like, screw that, that's stupid. The third wave coffee people really didn't respect that. Um, but the, the modern person and, and most people don't have that, uh, you know, palate. Yet. They don't know what good coffee is. So we have this thing where it's, you know, Mike worked at a coffee shop. He was able to test every kind of coffee. He wanted strong coffee, but he also wanted it to taste good. Um, and we charge a premium price for it. It is a premium blend. Um, and we always try to educate. And Alyssa is, is an amazing writer, and she writes a lot of blogs. And Tay kind of started that, where we educate our customers who might be Dunkin' Donuts or Folgers or the Starbucks, whatever's convenient. And uh, and we show them, you know, this is, this is good coffee, and here's how you can brew it. Here's Chemex, here's French press, here's alternative ways to enjoy your coffee. And now a lot of our fans that never ever would have gotten into that have like you see them like with a whole station set up and they're you know kettles and they're and they're doing that. So awesome question. But yeah, we, we try to blend the two the two worlds. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we have another question. Hey guys. Um you alluded to it earlier when you started selling online. All of a sudden, there are a lot of orders coming in, coming in, and you were falling behind. I was just wondering if you could go a little bit further into how you scaled during that that process in terms of like vendors, sources, and also staff. How quickly did that scale up and get you back to where you needed to be? Yeah, I was I was very green back then, and I was using I think ShipStation. No, oh, I was using PayPal to. to I'd have to, I'd had to print out every single order, and. Be, I basically, like, you th I was throwing the fire, you know what I mean? Throwing the fire when, when Good Morning America happened, where we had to produce, you know, thousands of, of pounds of orders all at once, and I didn't know how to do it. And I was, I was operating at a level where I could probably do maybe 50 pounds a day comfortably. Um, so, yeah, uh, how quickly did it happen? <laughs> Two months. <laughs> Two months. Um, you know, we, we started working with ShipStation. We were bulk printing orders after that. You know, we bought another computer, so it wasn't just one guy, like, printing out the orders. Um, I was, it, Kane came on probably, like, three weeks into it. I think right Tay, the time. Tay yeah. came along a little bit afterwards. Um, and there was five of us? There was five, and at the time um, when, and this is 2013, just to guys give you some, some reference of, of time. Uh, Mike had the idea 2011, 2012, we started selling. 2013, in March of 2013, Good Morning America happened. Um, and, you know, as I said before, like none of us really had jobs. We didn't know if it was going to be a sustainable company. Um, and around June, after we got through that whole thing and we realized that the sales were still coming and maybe we're onto something here, um, we spent the next year making sure that what had happened would never happen again. So like, we had flown up to the roof, but we didn't have a foundation yet. So Mike was like, okay, let's outsource all the stuff that we can't or don't want to do in-house. Um, and then let's, let's start slowly after that, start taking it back in. So we immediately made lists and, on paper and, and like, okay, this is what we're doing now. This is the process right now. How do we either get rid of the process, have someone else do it, or, or how can we do it more efficiently? Um, and so one of the things was, okay, 
okay, we can outsource to a distribution center. So we went around, and, and Taya and Eric, who's not here, um, went around and just interviewed distribution centers. And that was a huge thing. Now we don't have to actually package coffee. At that time, I spent you know anywhere between 8 to 12 hours a day packaging coffee. Um, and then once we figured out how to kind of make it sustainable, we started taking all that stuff back. And we're still taking stuff back uh, to be able to do everything under how, you know in-house. But uh, it was a process. Scaling is probably one of the tougher things that we've done. I mean, Mike was doing our accounting for years. I'm pretty sure he still has his hands in it. So, um, and I'm the same way with posting on Instagram. Like, I shouldn't be doing that anymore, but we're, we're all kind of doing it. Um, hiring, uh, we did use some temp services in the beginning, and we an ended up keeping a few of those people on. Um, but yeah, that scaling is impossible. It's not like you can, you know, look that up on the internet. We're still um, scaling. Yeah. I think the yeah. coolest thing is being able to attract um, talent. Uh, that's what I was most excited about. It took a long time because at first we would put like, you know, a Craigslist ad up and like, you know, this person, we're looking for this, but we don't have money to pay you. So like, here's a, a small money, but it's like, it might be bigger later. And uh, I think the most exciting thing for us right now is, is where, you know, we've, we've done multi millions of dollars of sales and, and we're, we're still, you know, growing and growing and growing. Um, being able to, to bring on a Dustin who's an absolute beast in, in everything he does. And, and like, okay, here's a problem, figure it out. And it's like, so he builds our, you know, our entire warehouse inventory. And then Jeff, like, you know so much about, you know, broadcasting and all this, your voice. Um, Alyssa, you're a content, you know, writer. Can we, you know, you want to come over here and, and work for us? And, and we've been able to do that, and we're still doing that. Super exciting. Yeah, it's like working for a small business. Like, I'm somebody that went from working in a corporation and then was very attracted to this. Like, what is this small business that seems to be doing really well? Like, what's going on over here? How can I get my hands into that? And I think that as far as scaling with people, as people start to see that and as we have jobs start to open, people are like, wait, how can I get involved in something that's cool and small and different than what, like, you know, working at the state or in upstate New York? So, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't think we've even touched on this. Like, that, at that point, Good Morning America, you said, that, you know, it was, it was a team of five. And then that blew up and obviously scaling up. And like I said, we're still scaling up. We have the largest employee base right now, and we're at 25? 23. 23. And that's the company. So I mean, you know, and doing what we do, it's still how do we how do we maintain that base but reach that ceiling and not you know go go nuts doing it. So it's a it's a it's a journey. It really is. I think the coolest thing also is being able to do what uh, what we what we're passionate about. Um, Matt, when we were on having lunch, he alluded to like the 20% time and people being able to have time to do projects they're passionate about. And and we, you know we're obviously on a much smaller scale, but we have a lot of things that we like. For instance, Alyssa, you might want to talk about the Grind It Out campaign, our first real marketing campaign where they had these ideas. I'll let you talk a little more about. Yeah. That. So basically, what we what, like we were talking about our fan base. We have a lot of nurses and uh, firefighters and things like that that really use the coffee to get them through the day. So what we decided to do was kind of put together a content campaign where we highlighted those people because we felt like, you know, so many companies are like highlighting that cool athlete or like highlighting this super famous person. But like who we want to champion is the people that are drinking our coffee. And that might be the nurse that's in the hospital or the EMT or all of those people. So yeah, so basically it was something where, you know, the marketing team, me, Taya, and our art director, Thomas, were like, yeah, wouldn't it be really cool to put together some videos of these people and blogs and playlists and all of this kind of stuff? And Mike was like, do it. So it's kind of been able to give us the, the freedom to just make creative projects and things like that. We, yeah. wanted, to show, we wanted to showcase it, and the, the greatest <laughs> tagline like that you guys came up with is, is we wanted to showcase how our coffee lives. Yeah. You know, and it's not just about whose hands we can put coffee into. It's about, like we said, you know, it's like you get up every morning and you might have a cup of coffee and then you're gonna go do something awesome, usually, you know? And it's like, okay, let's see you do that awesome thing. And yeah. why, how is, why are you doing that? And that's kind of where that whole marketing came from. Grind it out. Hashtag. Yeah, hashtag, hashtag grind, grind it out. out. Yeah. Grind it out. Everyone, just, everyone can pour your oh, after yeah. all the fun. <laughs> yeah. And we, we, yeah, it's like, it's, we wanna see everybody's grind because like you said, it's, it's how our coffee lives, so. Thank you. It really is um, a powerful and amazing story of the passion for a product leading to the creation of a family, uh, leading to the creation of a community. Uh, and it's interesting that the product itself is sort of secondary to all of that for you guys, that really it's about you being able to work together, follow your passions, and continue to grow this community out there. Um, to that respect, please let people know how they can find all of this. Where, where do you go to hear the podcast? How, where can you check out the coffee? 
Uh, yeah, go to deathwishcoffee.com. That's the easiest place. That's the, our, our content hub for everything. I mean, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, obviously, um, under Death Wish Coffee. Um, the podcast lives right off our homepage. So go to deathwishcoffee.com backslash... Deathcast. Deathcast. Uh, we're the top-selling coffee on Amazon. So if you go over there and type in coffee, we should be... Uh, under the headline bestseller, uh, you can buy it there, or you can also get it on Jet in but Walmart. But if you com. get it on our website, we actually have a. Um, we're going to be in your guys' employee discounts. I think in the next quarter, I, I worked a deal out with. Uh, I forgot who was the head of that, but if you do use uh, discount Google, um, you will get twenty percent off the uh, a bag of our co or whatever is on the website. Um, so you can share that internally. It hasn't been announced yet, but that should be coming um, very soon. It's been announced now. Yeah. <laughs> that You'll be able to that? find it on the <laughs> just he, a, he, said, he said he was going to share it around the office. That wasn't a big deal. He just hasn't, it hasn't been in the newsletter yet, so I don't think I broke any rules. But, uh, <laughs> surprise. We'll, we'll see. Also, get off that newsletter and get on our newsletter. Yeah. <laughs> and just to Anyone stay on the, the podcast <laughs> location, a, any Podbean, iTunes, it's Stitcher, everywhere. Google, We're Google everywhere. Music. We're up, we're up there too. So I mean, yeah, yeah you can, you can pretty much find us anyway. And like I said, we're getting into video too. So you know, YouTube, we're we're all over that. Facebook, all over Live. Facebook Live, yep. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for taking the time to come and join us and share your your amazing story with us. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks thank for you. having us. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.